Gerald Sutton Brown was Vancouver's first chief planner. He created its discretionary zoning system that combined, yet was distinct, from the United States and the United Kingdom. For two decades, Vancouver followed a different path from U.S. cities. The West End is one of his legacies, detached houses that evolved organically to higher density before Americanization retook the city. Vancouver originally used the British model in which cities self-organized with only limited planning. Then it switched to the U.S. model of rigid plans under Harlan Bartholomew. The U.S. got its system from Europe, opposite of the British approach. European gardens impose reason on nature. British gardens follow nature. European civil law comes from government decrees. British common law arises from ancient customs. The UK model requires government self-discipline, where legislators legislate less, planners plan less. Sutton Brown was hired under Mayor Fred Hume, who descended from royal engineers sent to prevent a US takeover of British Columbia. He wanted a planner from the Commonwealth to counter the US influence on Vancouver planning. Vancouver rarely hired Americans for positions at City Hall. Sutton Brown had been born and raised in Jamaica, attending Monroe College and the University of Southampton during the Depression. After his first year, the family suffered financially and he worked in the university cafeteria to pay tuition. He married a Canadian and joined the Lancashire Planning Department, working through the bombing of World War II, becoming chief planner. The entire county was four times the population of British Columbia, the industrial heartland and second largest urban area after London. His landmark preliminary plan for Lancashire impressed Vancouver leaders. Lancashire needed housing for 600,000 people, but only 300,000 were planned for. The suffering caused by lack of housing affected him deeply. Housing was his priority. He said, Excessive use and shading between the apartment blocks prevent green space which degenerate into patches of bare earth. This would compromise a city unless special forms of layout are adopted. In Vancouver, he would find his answer in the Point Tower. He wanted to foster a sense of community in contrast with the vast housing estates built between the wars. Sutton Brown became Vancouver's first chief planner in 1952. He oversaw a building boom of civic institutions that continue to serve us to this day. His regional planning committees recommended bridges at Second Arrows, Anasis Island, Port Mann, and the Vancouver Airport design. He lamented the artificial separation of city and region and was a driving force behind the Planning Institute of BC serving as its first president, convincing local governments to hire their own planners. He harnessed the discretionary powers of the Vancouver Charter through two committees. One, the Civic Design Panel, to encourage good design through consultation in the early stages, with a majority of architects in its membership. Two, the Technical Planning Board, which met every Friday, because all department heads were present they could quickly approve developments. It had two subcommittees, development permits and zoning and real estate. Sutton Brown zoning bylaw remains the foundation of our unique discretionary zoning system. It empowered the technical planning board to relax zoning constraints and introduced the flexible floor space ratio. A building with a fixed FSR can take many different forms. Vancouver did not fully embrace the U.S. model. It never adopted a comprehensive plan. Sutton Brown worked on areas that needed attention as they came up. He did planning, not plans. Rising house prices and sprawl were quickly corrected under his hybrid U.K. model. After measuring pedestrian counts downtown, he declared, the importance of the pedestrian is established and must receive major planning effort. His 20-year downtown plan declared, on no account should this heart be allowed to deteriorate. 
Vancouver went its own way. He wrote that the West End, where he lived, had a serious under-exploitation of density. He removed height limits and created a bonus system to encourage height in return for green space and amenities. The West End exemplifies the UK system, an unplanned variety of building types, all in one neighborhood. Because it was not master planned, it could respond to changing needs. West End Rules had six-story apartments covering the whole site. Sutton Brown's stacked floor space enabled a lush green West End. Building height depended on parcel size. Ocean Towers created a development view shadow. He had warned council it would be its biggest mistake. His rules against further slab buildings gave us the classic West End Point Tower. Juliet balconies extended when he removed four feet from floor space calculations. Setbacks were relaxed for entry structures, but increased for buildings. Elevator shafts, roof gardens, and parking were removed from FSR calculations. All windows had 50 degrees of views for at least 80 feet. He was obsessed with light to avoid dark and dingy spaces. Sutton Brown opposed housing on arterial streets. His West End shopping streets have only one story with no residential above. He wanted streets safer and quieter for children living in the area. His policies led to West End traffic calming. He wrote, the movement of automobiles inside the core needs to be limited and anything interfering with pedestrians or buses lessens the efficiency of the core, putting its survival in danger. He allowed all commercial uses downtown, but made industrial uses conditional to discourage warehousing and trucks. He ended the practice of false front blank sidewall. Buildings should be seen from all angles, made possible by his floor space ratio rules. Under Sutton Brown, Granville Street and Chinatown were second only to Shanghai in density of neon signs. He steered between unnecessarily restrictive signage and rowdy confusion, encouraging streets to instigate their own controls, opposing the US model of outright prohibitions or precise regulations. US planner Bartholomew had wanted public buildings moved to one civic center. Because Sutton Brown opposed this, Vancouver avoided the civic center dead zone, characteristic of US cities. He believed planners should respect the market, not stifle it. He wanted the need for conditional approval restricted to a minimum. Planners should not impose their own vision, nor stymie innovation. His approach led to the unique Vancouver Special, meeting the needs of multi-generational immigrant families. He encouraged dense neighborhood centers with diverse building types throughout low-density areas. In his 20 years, house prices remained stable despite rapid growth. He used public and private money to create social housing throughout the city, opposing concentration in one area. Sutton Brown originally opposed a freeway, calling it a drastic measure at a drastic price. But automobile use was increasing. The newly created certified planners were creating a continent-wide network of freeways. Governments were offering hundreds of millions of dollars for freeways and urban renewal projects. Sutton Brown needed to link city needs to government priorities. Bartholomew's US style plan had made the downtown freeway central to his vision. But the Lionsgate Bridge and the closing of the Burrard Inlet Ferry meant 30,000 cars per day were using the downtown as a through corridor. Sutton Brown wanted a third crossing to divert cars around the downtown. Federal freeway money could build his third crossing, replace the aging Georgia Viaduct, and even replace nearby unsafe housing. The great freeway debates of 1967 ended in January 1968, when the city joined the federal and provincial governments 
in refusing to fund a downtown freeway. There was no serious proposal for a freeway after that. Leonard Marsh, head of social work at UBC, an intellectual founder of the CCF NDP with access to federal funding, developed a plan to convert Strathcona to public housing. Sutton Brown warned against a US-style separate agency for urban renewal. Municipal control would ensure neighborhood accountability. Because of this, only a few blocks were built, and Vancouver avoided large tracts of public housing common in other cities. He recommended only limited clearance for unsafe housing and was the first in Canada to offer loans to upgrade existing houses. But with Strathcona houses $2 million each now, the only affordable housing left, especially for Chinese seniors, are the ones Sutton Brown built. Sutton Brown revealed his planning philosophy in a major speech. He had two pleas. One, greater participation by the public in planning affairs, and two, a spirit of restraint by the professional planner. He said, letting professionals do the job may be true in a benevolent dictatorship, but is catastrophic in a democracy. He cautioned planners against regulating too much, saying, these controls cannot substitute for private initiative, which is determined to doing a good job with developers regarding regulations as the maximum standard, where in fact it is the minimum. He said, regulation cannot substitute for the competence and enlightenment of the developer. Overregulation can result in efforts to circumvent the regulations and dissipate the energy required to producing a first-class job. He exhorted developers to build quality he urged planners to reject Daniel Burnham's plea to have no small plans. Their role should support and encourage the plans of others. Cities, like economies, are complex systems which can be harmed by too much human intervention. Sutton Brown had an intuitive understanding of the city as a complex system, unleashing its self-organizing power though we continue to operate within the framework of U.S. zoning. He opposed spot rezonings, but developed simple rules to guide developers on what they could not do, not what they must do, and adjusted them over time. He cared more about how a building lived than how it looked. His last years at the city were a race to build more housing, to prevent a shortage and rising house prices. Despite rapid growth, house prices hardly rose under his 21-year watch. Sutton Brown opposed a pulp mill in Coal Harbor. The Bayshore Inn was built instead. This convinced him that Vancouver's industrial waterfront could be converted to high-density housing. He focused on three projects. He negotiated a 20-foot-wide waterfront walkway connected to Stanley Park and encouraged Harbor Park with 15 towers of 30 stories. Project 200 would cover the railway tracks with office and residential towers and connect the city to the waterfront. But his focus was False Creek. The 1969 plan looks remarkably similar to what was built decades later with a waterfront walkway circling the entire creek. These three projects alone could accommodate over 50,000 people and prevent rising house prices, but they all came to a halt. After 21 years, a new party, Team, was elected and immediately fired Sutton Brown, a move criticized by councillors on the left and the right and the media. The city swung back to the U.S. regulatory model to replace natural economic forces with planning, stop densification, preserve single-family neighborhoods, and push growth to the suburbs. This model continues to this day. Team replaced Vancouver's British civil service model with the U.S. spoils system, replacing top bureaucrats with partisans, appointing a team city councillor to the new position 
of city manager. Gerald Sutton Brown served the city faithfully, never spoke negatively of any city officials, never defended himself from his attackers, nor criticized those who came after him. He represented the best of Vancouver's British civil service tradition. <laughs>